Cinderella met a lovely fellow prince charming at the ball. The ugly sisters with their warts and blisters used to make her scrub and crawl. I'll tell her tale for one and all. Cinderella. This is the story of Cinderella. Once upon a time, many moons ago, there was a gentleman called Baron Hardup, who had a very charming lady for his wife. They had a daughter whose name was Ella. She was a very good girl and always dutiful towards her doting parents. But sadly, Ella's mother died, causing much grief to her and her dear father. However, after two years had passed, Baron Hardup married another woman. The main reason the new wife was attracted to him was because he bore the title Baron. Oh, I'm married to a Baron. His new wife's name was Hyacinth, and she was so full of airs and graces oh. that she looked down on anyone she deemed working class. Oh. She had two unattractive grown-up daughters called Griselda and Imelda. Oh, I'm wonderful. <laughs> Not as wonderful as I Like their mother, they were social climbers of the highest order. They would do anything in their power to climb to the top of the social ladder. In fact, their ambition was to marry into royalty. The Baron's beautiful daughter, Ella, suffered greatly at the hands of these three harridans. They were jealous of her good looks, her charming nature, and her ability to get on with everyone around her. Griselda and Imelda particularly hated her. They pushed her around and made her do all the chores around Hardup Hall, where they all lived in relative poverty, due to the spendthrift ways of the Baron's insatiably greedy new wife. Do you like my new hat? The Baron's manservant, Buttons, was the only one to recognise poor Ella's plight. Griselda and Imelda, whom Buttons called the Ugly Sisters, forced their poor stepsister to clean the chimneys every day. Up the chimney, up the chimney now. Causing her clothes to be covered in cinders. Oh, look, Ella's covered in cinders, remarked Griselda. That's what we'll call her, Cinderella. <laughs> Aha! Cinderella! I think that name has a ring to it, Imelda noted, laughing at the newly renamed Cinderella's expense. <laughs> the two ugly sisters and their insidious mother, Hyacinth, continued to laugh with all their might. <laughs> When they left the room, Buttons consoled poor Cinderella. Don't worry, they'll get their comeuppance. What goes around, comes around, he added, as Cinderella sobbed into her handkerchief. <laughs> Why, thank you, Buttons, you're so kind, said Cinderella, but I'll believe it when I see it. The next morning, there was a knock on the door of Hardup Hall. Hyacinth answered to be greeted by a messenger from the king's palace. I bring you invitations to a grand ball, said the messenger. King Charles is throwing the ball in aid of his son, Prince Charming, for he wants him to find a suitable wife who will look after the heir to the throne. Ooh, heir to the throne said Hyacinth. Who are the invitations for? she asked, whilst visualising one of her daughters on the throne next to the handsome Prince Charming. The messenger replied, I have three invitations, one for Griselda, one for Imelda, and one for a young lady known as Ella. Oh, Ella left many moons ago, without so much as a by your leave, said Hyacinth. But I'll take the three invitations just the same. If Ella does return, she will get her invitation. 
But in the meantime, I'll give the other two to the beautiful Griselda and Imelda. The messenger, satisfied that his job had been done, set off on his horse to deliver the rest of the invitations to the other young ladies of the kingdom. At last the big day arrived. The ugly sisters, Griselda and Imelda, set off to the ball in high spirits, but looking like mutton dressed as lamb. Griselda wore a bright, sickly green frock, so ill-fitting that her flabby stomach caused the garment to burst at the seams. Her bright blue smudged lipstick seemed to highlight her blackened teeth and her unkempt prickly moustache. Imelda wore a garish pink satin ball gown that was also too tight for her portly frame. As they left in Baron Hardup's horse-drawn carriage, Cinderella broke down and began to cry. Don't worry, said Buttons to Cinderella. We can have a ball of our own. Look, I have prepared some ginger beer and cucumber sandwiches. Oh, Buttons. I really appreciate your trying to cheer me up, said Cinderella, as she politely sipped at the ginger beer and nibbled the slightly stale cucumber sandwiches. I brought my flute. I can play you a tune so we can dance and sing along and pretend we're at the royal ball, said Buttons. And as the two of them danced for an hour or more, Cinderella began to accept that she was never destined to go to the ball. She also came to appreciate that the finer things in life did not come from being rich, but from the heart as someone as humble as the kindly buttons. Suddenly, there was a loud knocking at the door of Hardup Hall. Baron Hardup burst into the room and ordered buttons to answer the door. Whoever it is, send them away. I am busy reading my papers and I do not wish to be interrupted. Also, I would appreciate it if you would stop dancing around and playing music. I need peace to concentrate on all things important to me. No problem, said Buttons as he left to answer the door. Cinderella and her father, Baron Hardup, had a brief but reflective moment. I am sorry you were not able to attend the royal ball, said Baron Hardup. But you must accept your fate, as I must accept mine. We are both lumbered with Hyacinth, Griselda and Imelda, and unless our fortunes change dramatically, we will have to endure them for the rest of our lives. On that note, Baron Hardup briefly hugged his confused daughter before returning to read his papers. Thank you, Daddy. Shortly afterwards, Buttons returned with an old woman at his side. Who are you? inquired Cinderella. I am your fairy godmother, said the old woman, who twirled three times, thus transforming herself into a beautiful fairy with huge white wings, a long sparkling magic wand, and a little halo that hovered just above her beehive of blonde hair. My fairy godmother? This is extraordinary. What brings you here? asked a bedazzled Cinderella. What is the thing you most wish for on this night of all nights? asked the fairy godmother. If the truth were known, whispered Cinderella, I wish I could go to the ball. I was summoned here by the force of magic, said the fairy godmother. And believe me, Cinderella, you shall go to the ball. Without hesitation, with her magic wand, she conjured up an invitation to the ball. Cinderella's name was written across it in gold and endorsed by the king's signature. Oh, this is wonderful, said Cinderella. But alas, I don't have any clothes to wear to the ball. 
The fairy godmother again waved her magic wand, causing Cinderella's old rags to be transformed into the most beautiful ball gown ever seen. What's more, her scruffy, soot-ridden shoes were replaced by a pair of gorgeous crystal glass slippers. Oh, this is marvellous, exclaimed Cinderella. I am very grateful, but alas, I still won't be able to go to the ball, for I have no way of getting there. Fear not, said the fairy godmother. I have a solution. On saying that, she opened the window and pointed her magic wand at an old hollow pumpkin that had been lying in the courtyard since Halloween. A flash of light suddenly surrounded the pumpkin that mysteriously morphed into the most beautiful and illustrious oh, carriage Cinderella had it's ever magic. seen. Wow, said Cinderella. Oh, this is marvellous. But I still can't go to the ball, as there is no horse to guide the carriage to the palace. Fear not, said the fairy godmother again. You should know by now that I have solutions for such matters. She pointed her magic wand towards a rat that happened to be scurrying past the carriage, thus transforming it into a beautiful black stallion fit for a princess. <laughs> Why, thank you so much, said Cinderella. This is like a dream come true. But alas... I still can't go to the ball. I have no one to drive the carriage to the palace. I'll drive you there, said Buttons, but Baron Hardup hasn't brought me a suit for years. You don't need to drop hints, said the fairy godmother with a knowing smile on her kindly face. In no time at all, she had transformed the scruffy-looking Buttons into the most dandy and handsome horseman Cinderella had ever seen. Cinderella cried out in delight and thanked Buttons and her fairy godmother. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. My dream has come true. Luckily for Cinderella, Baron Hardup had dozed off in the sitting room and was snoring oh, so loudly oh, that he was not so disturbed wonderful. by Cinderella's excitement. I'm so happy. Hush now, child, you'll wake your father, who is asleep in his chair, said the fairy godmother. Then she waved her wand one more time. Suddenly, Cinderella and Buttons found themselves in the carriage behind the horse, with the fairy godmother standing nearby. You are now prepared to go to the royal ball in style, my child, said the fairy godmother. But remember, this is magic, and like all magic spells, they have to wear off at some point. You must remember to leave the palace before the stroke of midnight, for at this moment your beautiful dress will turn back to rags, and the horse and carriage will turn back into the hollow pumpkin and the rat. Your handsome horseman will be plain old buttons in his scruffy servant attire. I'll be sure to remember that, said Cinderella. I shall leave at least twenty minutes before the stroke of midnight in order to give us time to return to Hardup Hall in style. Goodbye, Cinderella, and good luck, said the fairy godmother, who mysteriously and slowly vanished into thin air. As Buttons guided the horse and carriage towards the palace, people in the street stopped to stare at the magnificent sight. What a fantastic adventure, said Cinderella. I shall go to the ball. I know, it's wonderful, said Buttons. You look so beautiful and elegant. Once you are there, you will be the belle of the ball. Meanwhile, at the ball... Prince Charming wandered around, introducing himself to the ladies of the kingdom. Although polite and courteous to all of them, he looked visibly antagonized by the two hags who were following him around. Predictably, it was Griselda and Imelda vying and competing for the prince's attention. Your Highness, said Griselda, I've heard so much about your balls. I hear they get bigger every year. Is this your biggest ball to date? He's not interested in you, 
said Imelda. It's quite clear he only has eyes for me. Dear ladies, said Prince Charming, thank you for your attention, but I must ask you to leave me in peace, for I have just seen a lady so elegant and so fine that I am compelled to approach her and invite her to dance with me. He was looking towards the ballroom door, where Cinderella had arrived, looking so beautiful and magnificent that she had already managed to steal the prince's heart. Who's that, pray? said Griselda, oblivious to the fact that the beautiful lady was her downtrodden stepsister, Cinderella. I don't know and I don't care replied Imelda as the prince approached his new potential love. He'll soon tire of her, said Griselda. She is scrawny and not half as glamorous as I. Too right, said Imelda. He will tire of her, but it will be me he comes to for the next dance. The two ugly sisters watched in envy as Prince Charming and the mystery girl danced and danced throughout the night. This is your fault. You scared him off with your ridiculous remarks, said Imelda to Griselda. She retorted by saying, Nonsense! You put him off by making yourself seem too available and cheap. At this point, the two of them started to fight, ripping each other's clothes to shreds. Their disgraceful behaviour was spotted by the king's footman, who had to separate them and reprimand them for their bad behaviour. The prince and the mystery girl laughed about the unseemly episode as they waltzed across the ballroom, staring lovingly into each other's eyes. I'm having such a wonderful time, said Cinderella. So am I, said Prince Charming, who added, Whatever happens between us, I will savour this moment for the rest of my life. Oh, look at them, said Griselda. They don't look right together. You're right, said Imelda. There's something about her that doesn't ring true. By now, Hyacinth, who had been monitoring the ugly sister's activities, joined her daughters. Try and split them apart, said Hyacinth. That girl is an imposter. The irony was that the only imposter there was Hyacinth, who had gained entrance to the ball by passing herself off as Cinderella. Before either of the ugly sisters had the opportunity of breaking the bond between the love-struck prince and the mystery girl, the clock started to strike midnight. Oh, no! Cinderella panicked. I'm so sorry, Prince Charming, but I have to go. And then in haste, she ran away. Where are you going? shouted the prince. But in fear of her identity being revealed, Cinderella swiftly left the palace. On the way down the steps, Cinderella tripped and lost one of her crystal slippers. Noticing she was once again wearing rags, Cinderella ran on past the palace guards so fast they could not see her face. She saw Buttons waiting next to the hollow pumpkin and the rat. Come, said Buttons, who was also back in his old clothes. Let's get back to Hard Up Hall before we get caught out. Yes, of course. As they ran home, Cinderella told Buttons what had happened between her and the prince. They concluded that it was better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. The next morning, it was business as usual at Hardup Hall. The ugly sisters and their mother forced Cinderella to make breakfast and tidy the house. Finally, they ordered her to clean the chimneys, which always ensured she would look sooty and downtrodden. Look at her, the scruffy little urchin, said Griselda. I know, I'm ashamed to be associated with her, said Imelda. Can you imagine if she had been allowed to attend the ball last night? 
she would put us all to shame. Now, now, said Baron Hardup, don't be too hard on Cinderella. She knows her place and works so hard. Stop picking on my wonderful daughters, said Hyacinth. You should have seen them last night at the ball. The prince was all over them like a rash. Hmm, said Baron Hardup doubtfully. I'm sure he was, and as usual disappeared behind his papers. <coughs> Unexpectedly, there was a loud knock on the door, followed by trumpets playing a regal fanfare. Buttons rushed to answer the door and was surprised to be greeted by a royal messenger, surrounded by guards and trumpeteers. Greetings, said the messenger, who stood at the steps of Hardup Hall, holding the crystal glass slipper Cinderella had lost whilst fleeing from the ball. Cinderella, Baron Hardup, the ugly sisters and Hyacinth gathered around buttons at the door. What brings you to my humble abode? inquired the baron. Less of the humble, said Hyacinth. You are a baron, after all. Why are you holding that glass slipper? asked Griselda. Why indeed? asked Imelda. There is something very strange going on here, she added, before being interrupted by the irritated messenger. If you would let me get a word in edgeways, I will explain, dear lady. Last night, Prince Charming met the love of his life. Unfortunately, she unexpectedly fled from the ball as the clock struck midnight. On leaving, she lost this glass slipper on the palace steps. Oh, she's very clumsy then, isn't she? said Griselda. Quite right, said Imelda. But it's very good that the palace's lost property department is so efficient. I presume the prince no longer loves the fool who lost the slipper, but is attempting to return it to her by way of compensation. You are wrong, said the messenger. He intends to marry the lady whose foot fits the slipper. Oh, said Griselda. It's just coming back to me. The slipper is mine. It was I who danced with the prince for the entire duration of the ball. She grabbed the slipper and tried to force her swollen, hairy foot into it. But inevitably and predictably, Griselda failed to impress upon the messenger that the slipper had anything to do with her. The slipper is mine, cried Imelda. It was I who danced with Prince Charming. I didn't mention it at first, for I was embarrassed about losing the slipper. She snatched the slipper from Griselda's hand and, like her ugly sister, tried to force her hairy, bunion-ridden foot into it. She sweated profusely and tried every way to get the slipper to fit her. Enough is enough. You are not Prince Charming's love, said the messenger, confiscating the slipper from Imelda, who was devastated. She cried and wept into her mother's arms. Oh, mama, mama. <laughs> I've been deprived of being Prince Charming's love. What am I to do? I am a broken woman. Well, you had your chance, said Baron Hardup. Now step aside and let Cinderella try on the slipper. Cinderella, said Hyacinth, don't be ridiculous. She wasn't even at the ball. Well, you never know. The slipper might just fit her anyway whispered the Baron to his seething wife. Ridiculous, ridiculous. The messenger handed Cinderella the slipper and said, Please, try it on. It is my duty to ensure every maiden in the land has this opportunity. He added, I have been to every home in the land, but failed to find any fair maiden whose foot is the exact fit for this wonderful slipper. 
The ugly sisters, Hyacinth and Baron Hardup, gasped with disbelief when it became apparent that the slipper fitted Cinderella's dainty foot perfectly. Buttons simply smiled and winked towards the delighted Cinderella. Outrageous, screamed Griselda. Disgraceful, cried Imelda. It's a miscarriage of justice. The slipper is mine. My toenails had grown overnight. That's the only reason the slipper didn't fit. Griselda and Imelda, you are a disgrace, said Baron Hardup. You should be pleased for your stepsister. Yes, you should, said the messenger. And I am pleased too, for my work is done. I have found the prince's love, and he will be more than pleased with me for finding him the girl of his dreams. Cinderella was taken to meet the prince at the palace. The spark of love was rekindled. They spent their time together, falling more and more in love as the day went on. I love you so much, said Prince Charming, who produced a ruby ring which he handed to Cinderella whilst going down on one knee. Will you marry me and be my wife? asked the prince. Of course, said Cinderella. The loving couple were married in the palace the very next day and held their reception in the ballroom. This is where we first met, said Cinderella. It means so much to me that our wedding reception is here. I agree, said Prince Charming. The first time I saw you here in this very room, I knew I was to spend the rest of my life with you. As Baron Hardup hobnobbed with his new friends, King Horatio and his wife, Queen Henrietta, the ugly sisters and their mother tried to put on a brave face. Well, at least we're closer to royalty than we were before, said Griselda. I suppose you're right, said Imelda. We'll just have to get used to the fact that we are second fiddle to Cinderella, Hyacinth agreed. Now we're in with the royal family, perhaps you two could find a couple of nice knights or even lords. Oh, the sky is the limit. They all lived happily ever after at the palace. Griselda was soon to marry one of the king's guards and did, eventually, become a little more down to earth. Imelda settled down and married a humble servant of the realm. At Cinderella's request, Buttons was given the job of royal butler. It was whilst carrying out his royal duties he met the royal housekeeper, with whom he fell very much in love. As for Baron Hardup, his relationship with Hyacinth greatly improved. I'm so pleased that the girls are getting on much better, he said, and I love our life here at the palace. I couldn't agree with you more, my darling man, said Hyacinth, as she lay lovingly in her husband's arms. Years later, When the king died, Prince Charming was the natural heir to the throne. On the day he was crowned king and Cinderella queen, they were taken by horse and carriage on a grand procession through the streets of the kingdom. They stopped in one street to wave at the enthusiastic crowd. Cinderella spotted a little old lady waving towards her with a mysterious glint in her eye. Surely it can't be. But it is. Oh, it's the old woman who turned into my fairy godmother. Without Prince Charming being aware of the old lady's significance, Cinderella called out to her. Thank you. Thank you so much for changing my life. Then suddenly, right before the happy couple's eyes, the little old lady smiled and then disappeared into thin air. Cinderella met a lovely fellow, Prince Charming at the ball.
Paul. The ugly sisters with their warts and blisters used to make her scrub and crawl. I'll tell her tale for a while. This is a story that could make you go pale About a big bad wolf in the wood For this is a story that tells the tale About Little Red Riding Hood Little Red Riding Hood This is the story of Little Red Riding Hood A long, long time ago, in a vast forest There lived a young girl known as Little Red Riding Hood she got her name from her doting grandmother, who had given her a wonderful red riding hood of velvet, which she wore at all times. One fine sunny day, Little Red Riding Hood was playing in the garden of her mother's cottage and thinking fondly of her beloved grandmother, who she had not seen for what seemed like months. Suddenly, her mother appeared at the kitchen door with a large parcel in her hands. "'What's in the parcel, mother?' inquired Little Red Riding Hood inquisitively. "'Inside the parcel is a rich and delicious fruitcake for your grandmother,' replied her mother, adding, "'She is not very well, and the cake is full of goodness. "'You must take this parcel to your grandmother at once. "'She will be so pleased to see you, and the cake will revitalize her and make her feel better.'" Little Red Riding Hood was sad that her grandmother was poorly, but thrilled that she was to see the old lady she had missed so much of late. Oh, said the mother, also in the parcel is a bottle of milk. Do not drop the parcel, for the milk bottle will smash, ruin the cake, and leave nothing for your grandmother to eat or drink. Oh, golly. I understand, mother. I'll be sure to be careful, replied Little Red Riding Hood, as she took the neatly wrapped parcel from her mother's hand. Thank you, Mummy. Have a safe journey, said Mother, and remember, just follow the winding path all the way to the other side of the forest. That way you will arrive safely at the front door of your grandmother's house. I will, Mother, said an excited little red riding hood, as she kissed her mother on the cheek and bid her farewell. And remember, said Mother, as her daughter skipped away with parcel in hand, don't stray from the path. All right, I'll remember. However, Little Red Riding Hood knew a shortcut, and she strayed from the winding path in order to cross a rickety old wooden bridge. It was when she reached the other side of the bridge that a wily but seemingly friendly old wolf greeted her. Good day, little girl, said the wolf. You look very fetching in that red riding hood. Why, thank you, she replied. That's very kind of you to say so. Little did she know the wolf was hungry and was already making a plan to gobble her up. Where are you going? asked the big bad wolf. I'm off to Grandmother's house because she is poorly, said Little Red Riding Hood as she innocently gazed into the wolf's evil, hungry eyes. What's in the parcel? the wolf asked while salivating at the thought of eating the little girl. Cake and milk, she replied. My grandmother is sick, but my mother tells me the cake and milk will make her feel better. <sighs> said the big bad wolf. How very thoughtful and kind. Just as a matter of interest, where does your grandmother live? Little Red Riding Hood innocently explained to the wolf exactly where her grandmother lived, whilst she picked flowers to form a bouquet for her dear beloved grandmother. It's not far. You're a very good granddaughter said the sly wolf. I hope your grandmother makes a speedy recovery. Thank you. 
He said goodbye to Little Red Riding Hood and disappeared into the woods. Goodbye, little girl. Little Red Riding Hood was completely unaware that the wolf was running towards her grandmother's house at a great speed so that he could eat her too. It's my lucky day, said the wolf. I intend to eat them both. <laughs> the wolf knocked on grandmother's front door. At first, there was no reply, so he knocked a little louder, and trying to imitate Little Red Riding Hood, he said, Open up, Grandmother. It's your beloved granddaughter, Little Red Riding Hood. I bring you a parcel containing cake and milk. It will make you feel better and cure you of all ills. Lift the latch, called the grandmother. I am so weak and sick, I am unable to get out of my bed. The big bad wolf was delighted and entered the grandmother's house. He walked through the kitchen and up the stairs until he came to grandmother's bedroom. When he opened the bedroom door, Little Red Riding Hood's grandmother was horrified to see the wolf as he opened up his huge, gaping jaws. Oh dear. Leave at once! Help! Help! She screamed, but it was too late. The wolf had eaten her up. Yum, yum, Grandmama was delicious, said the wolf. But I can't wait for my main course, Little Red Riding Hood. I hope she tastes as delicious as she looks. He then found some nightclothes whilst rummaging through Grandmother's wardrobe. He put on a gown and a nightcap and then got into bed and patiently waited for Little Red Riding Hood to arrive at the house. Eventually, Little Red Riding Hood reached her grandmother's house, but she was more than a little surprised to find the door ajar. Oh dear, she said, how can this be? It's not like grandmother to leave the door open. She's always so careful. She crept into the house nervously. Grandmother, are you there? she asked. Getting no reply, she knocked at her grandmother's bedroom door three times. Come, said a voice from the room. Enter, my dear. I am too sick to get out of my bed. All right. Little Red Riding Hood entered the room, thinking how her grandmother's voice seemed to be somehow different. As she entered, she saw her grandmother lying in the bed with her nightcap pulled over her face, looking very strange indeed. Oh, grandmother, she said, what huge ears you have. All the better to hear you with, replied the big bad wolf. And grandmother, what big eyes you have. All the better. To see you with, said the cunning, evil, big bad wolf. And grandmother, what large, hairy hands you have. All the better to hug you with, said the wolf. And the hair keeps my hands warm in the cold weather. Oh, grandmother, what huge, sharp teeth you have. Then suddenly, the wolf leapt from the bed and let out a mad, evil laugh. <laughs> All the better to eat you with, he screamed, and then he swallowed Little Red Riding Hood whole. The wolf was so tired, having eaten Little Red Riding Hood and her grandmother, that he let out a huge yawn. <sighs> oh, 
Then he opened the parcel containing the cake and milk. Mmm, dessert, he said. And he ate the cake and washed it down with the milk. The big bad wolf now took a nice relaxing nap on the bed and he began to snore very loudly. In fact, his snoring was so loud, it came to the attention of a local huntsman and neighbour who just so happened to be passing by. That snoring sounds strange, said the huntsman, and he entered the house to check that everything was how it should be. When he entered the bedroom, he saw the big bad wolf lying in the bed. He prodded the wolf with his rifle. The big bad wolf woke up looking startled and scared. Aha! said the huntsman. It's the big bad wolf. I have hunted you for some time, you evil creature. And now I'm going to shoot you so you can never terrorize the people of the forest as you have done for so many years. Please spare me, said the wolf. I promise to change my ways. But then it occurred to the huntsman that the big bad wolf may have eaten the grandmother and that there may just be a way of saving her. He knocked the wolf out cold with the butt of the rifle and then produced a pair of scissors. He skillfully snipped open the wolf's stomach and was surprised to see a young girl in a red riding hood. My goodness. She sprung out and said, Oh, oh, thank you, kind huntsman. It was so dark and awful inside that wolf. On further inspection, the good huntsman found little red riding hood's grandmother inside the wolf. Well, I never... He pulled her from the wolf, and the grandmother was reunited with her granddaughter at last. I'm alive and feeling so much better, said the grandmother. She thanked the huntsman and then hugged her granddaughter, who she was so thrilled to see. Feeling hungry, they went to the kitchen, where they sat down at the table and ate a feast of some cake and milk that the huntsman just so happened to be carrying inside his shoulder bag. That's Yum. just what I needed, said the grandmother. I feel even better now. In fact, I feel as right as rain. Before the huntsman left, he made sure the big bad wolf was well and truly dead before packing its skin into his shoulder bag, thus claiming his well-deserved prize. He bid Little Red Riding Hood and her grandmother farewell and told them to be more careful in future. Always keep your doors locked and never, ever stray away from the path, I won't. he added, before leaving to continue his work. He's right, said Little Red Riding Hood. I will never stray from the path again. She was true to her word, for on another occasion, Little Red Riding Hood was taking a parcel of cake and milk to her grandmother and was approached by another big bad wolf. He tried desperately to entice the little girl from the path. However, remembering what she had promised her grandmother... No, thank you, Mr. Wolf. She stayed on the path until she reached her destination. I'm here. Little Red Riding Hood stepped inside the house and the grandmother locked the door with the new locks fitted by the kindly huntsman. Soon afterwards, Le the second Le big bad wolf knocked and said, Open the door, grandmother. It's me, Little Red Riding Hood. I bring you cake and milk. When there was no reply, the wolf jumped up on the roof of the house so that when Little Red Riding Hood was leaving, he could pounce on her and gobble her up for tea. The grandmother, however, had seen the big bad wolf jump onto the roof and knew about his deadly intentions. I know what he's up to. 
With her beloved granddaughter, she hatched a cunning plan and began to fry up some delicious sausages that had been brought to her by the huntsman. This'll get him good and proper. Oh, goody. Once cooked to sizzling perfection, they placed the sausages on a stick and dangled them out of the window at the side of the house, just above a deep lake. That'll do it. The smell of the delicious sausages was irresistible to the big bad wolf, who sniffed and sniffed and sniffed, moving gingerly to the side of the house until he slipped and fell into the lake and drowned. <coughs> At the end of the joyous day, Little Red Riding Hood thanked her grandmother for a wonderful time. Thank you, Grandma, for a wonderful day. She then skipped home to her mother's cottage, not once straying from the path. And from that day on, no one ever did anything to try and harm Little Red Riding Hood again. This is a story that could make you go pale about a big bad wolf in the wood. For this is a story that tells the tale about Little Red Riding Hood. Little Red Riding Hood. This is the story that tells the tale of a Amanda on the wall. That told the wicked Queen Snow White was the fairest of them all. The fairest of them all. Snow White. Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Many, many moons ago, in the midst of winter, when the snowflakes were falling like feathers from the sky, a queen called Gardenia was sewing. While standing by the open window, she pricked her finger, causing three droplets of blood to fall upon the snow outside. The image of the black window frame, the red blood and the white snow became embedded in Queen Gardenia's mind. Soon the queen was to have a daughter, whose hair was as black as the window frame and whose cheeks were as red as the blood that had fallen on the pure white snow. Remembering the day she had pricked her finger, she called her beautiful little daughter Snow White. Sadly, Queen Gardenia died after giving birth, causing much distress to Snow White's father, King Horatio. After a year had passed, the king took himself another wife, who was to become known as Queen Claudia. She was a glamorous, beautiful queen, but was also an arrogant, nasty, haughty woman who could not bear the sight of anyone who looked remotely as beautiful as her. Queen Claudia had a huge, magnificent looking glass with imposing gargoyles embossed around its elegant ivory frame. She stood in front of the looking glass and asked, Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? Suddenly, within the looking glass that had magical qualities, the face of an old man appeared. He had a shock of grey hair and deep, menacing, dark, foreboding eyes. Claudia, Claudia, I answer your call to tell of the fairest of them all. He replied with an air of mystery and then added, Her cheeks are rose red and her hair black as night. For the girl that I speak of is known as Snow White. The queen turned green with envy. 
From that moment on, she could not look at her stepdaughter, Snow White, without feeling enraged with jealousy. Her envy turned to hatred, causing her many sleepless nights. The wicked queen called upon a local huntsman, to whom she gave a handful of gold and silver coins. Take Snow White into the woods, she said, and be sure to kill her. Then throw her body to the wild creatures of the night, and at last I will be the fairest of them all. Once you have achieved your goal, bring me back her heart as proof that you have carried out the job I have paid you for. The huntsman did as instructed by the queen. He bundled Snow White into a sack and took her to a secluded woodland area in order to carry out the evil deed. But he stopped in his tracks as Snow White appealed to the softer side of his nature. Please, dear man, spare me my life. I promise I will disappear deep into the woods and make sure I am never seen again. The huntsman took pity on Snow White and let her run off into the woods. Oh, well, he said, at least I won't have Snow White's death on my conscience. And if the woodland creatures attack her and eat her, it will have nothing to do with me. He then hunted down a wild boar, took out its heart, and presented it to the queen, claiming it was that of Snow White. Night was approaching, and poor Snow White was alone in the dark woods, with the howling wind shaking the leaves of the trees, causing her to feel vulnerable and very frightened indeed. She saw many fierce-looking animals, but managed to avoid eye contact with them. Using the moon as her only source of light, she negotiated her way across a huge lake by jumping across some precariously spaced stepping stones. When she reached the other side of the lake, she came to a small pink and blue coloured tumbled down cottage with a rather badly thatched roof and a chimney pot that had seen better days. She knocked at the door, but there was no reply. She then opened the door and entered the cottage. To Snow White's surprise, unlike the outside, the inside was neat and tidy. It had a table that was set with seven plates of food, seven knives and forks, and seven little cups of milk. Against the wall were seven little beds covered in ruby red and royal blue blankets. By now, Snow White was so hungry that she ate vegetables and meat from each of the seven plates and took a sip of milk from each cup. Then, tired and still traumatised from the terrible things she had endured earlier, she decided to sleep on one of the beds. The first six she tried did not suit her, one being too low, another too short, another too hard, another too soft, another too itchy, and another a little too lopsided. But the seventh bed suited her perfectly, and she fell into a deep, deep sleep. Suddenly, around midnight, the owners of the cottage came home. They were seven dwarves whose job in life was to dig the mountains for ore. They noticed at once that they had an intruder in their midst. The first dwarf said, Who's been sitting in my chair? The second said, Who's been eating of my plate? The third said, Who's been eating my food? The fourth said, And who's been eating mine? The fifth said, Who's been using my fork? The sixth said, Who's been using my knife? And finally the seventh asked, Who's been drinking from my cup? And then he looked around and saw a bump beneath the blanket on his bed. Who 
Who's that sleeping in my bed? He exclaimed. The seven dwarfs all gathered around the bed and saw Snow White lying there, deep in the land of dreams, far away from the nightmarish reality she had encountered only hours before. Oh, my! The first dwarf cried. What a lovely child! The kindly dwarfs were so enchanted at the sight of Snow White that they let her sleep on in the bed. That night, the seventh dwarf slept with his companions, one hour with each. And so passed the night. The next morning, Snow White woke up and was indeed alarmed at the sight of the seven dwarfs pottering around the cottage. But they were very friendly towards her and asked her name. Don't be shy, tell us, said the first dwarf. Snow White, she answered. My name is Snow White. What brings you here to our tumble-down cottage? asked the second dwarf. Yes, it's a strange choice, said the third. It's hardly inviting from the outside. Snow White told the seven dwarves of her stepmother's wish to have her killed and how the huntsman had spared her life. The dwarves were shocked and learned that the wicked stepmother Snow White referred to was none other than Queen Claudia. The fourth dwarf said, If you stay in our home, we shall look after you. And you shall want for nothing, my dear. Snow White was delighted, and although the cottage was not the palace she was used to, she loved her new abode and her new friends, the seven dwarves. Over the ensuing weeks, whilst the seven dwarves were at work searching for copper and gold, Snow White would keep their home tidy and make sure there was food on the table for them when they returned from a hard day's toil. But one day, over a feast of broth and dumplings, the fifth dwarf said to Snow White, Beware, dear girl. Your stepmother will soon find that you are here with us, so be sure you let no one into our humble abode. Meanwhile, back at the palace, the evil Queen Claudia, believing she had devoured Snow White's heart, preened around the palace, thinking she was the fairest of them all. Oozing confidence, she approached the looking glass and asked, Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? The mysterious man appeared immediately and replied, Although Queen Claudia is a heavenly sight, the fairest of all is a girl called Snow White. She is alive and lives over the dell. Thanks to seven kind dwarves, Snow White's looking so well. The Queen was astounded, as she knew the man in the looking glass never conveyed anything but the truth. However, she had to accept the huntsman had betrayed her, and that Snow White was very much alive. She contemplated how she might kill Snow White, the girl who was preventing her from being the fairest of them all. She dressed up as an old peddler woman and walked up to the door of the seven dwarves' rickety old cottage. She knocked on the door and cried in a cackling voice, Pretty things to sell, my lovelies, very cheap indeed. Snow White popped her head out of the window and said, Good day, kind woman. What have you to sell? Good things, she answered. Laces of all colours and sizes. And she pulled out handkerchiefs made out of the most beautiful silk. The trusting Snow White ignored the dwarf's warning and opened the door to the fragile, kindly-looking old peddler woman. They 
dear, said the old peddler woman, looking Snow White up and down. You look so unsightly, but with a little help from me, you can be transformed. Come, let me lace you properly. Snow White was enamoured with the bright array of laces and allowed the old deer to wrap them around her. But she wrapped them so tightly that poor Snow White found it hard to breathe and she fell to the floor as if dead. <laughs> hey, now who is the fairest of them all? Queen Claudia cackled as she made her way back to the palace, <laughs> laughing all the way. <laughs> When the dwarfs returned to the cottage, they were alarmed to find Snow White lying in a heap on the floor. After much discussion, they cut her free from the laces. Suddenly, Snow White began to breathe again, and her life was spared. The dwarfs concluded that the peddler woman was none other than Snow White's stepmother, Queen Claudia. The next day, the wicked queen asked the looking glass, a mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? The mysterious old man appeared and replied, Snow White is the fairest of them all, for she is alive and well, the girl was saved by the seven dwarves from just beyond the dell. Cushes! wrapped the queen. She is still alive, but I will put an end to her once and for all. For the second time, the wicked queen approached the door of the dwarves' cottage. She was disguised as an old travelling woman, selling items such as heather and other cheap items. Good things to sell, she cried out. All cheap, so cheap. Snow White looked out of the window and said, Go away, I am not allowed to open the door to you. But you can look, said the old woman, who produced a poisoned comb that had been tainted by an evil spell which would ensure Snow White could not resist purchasing it. As soon as she opened the door, the old woman started to comb Snow White's hair, thus poisoning her immediately. Poor Snow White fell to the floor at the door of the cottage and seemed to be well and truly dead. At last I am the fairest of them all, pronounced the queen, and left chuckling all the way back to the palace. <laughs> Shortly after the evil queen's departure, the dwarves returned to find their little friend slumped in a heap by the door. Take that comb from her hair, said the sixth dwarf. It looks suspicious. And as the comb was removed from her hair, Snow White came round. It transpired that the comb had not had time to completely overpower her. You must be more vigilant, Snow White said the seventh dwarf. Never open the door to anyone ever again. Meanwhile, Queen Claudia peered smugly into the looking glass once more. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? The mysterious man replied, Snow White's the fairest of them all. She is very much alive. The seven dwarves have found her, and they've helped her to survive. The queen raged. Snow White will die, even if it costs me my own life. She then produced a nice, big, juicy, enticing apple that was poisonous to the core. The queen gave herself a potion that would protect her from the poison in the apple. Dressed 
just as a farmer's wife, she knocked at the door of the dwarves' cottage. Apples for sale, lovely, luscious apples, she cried. Snow White peered from the window. Go away, please, she said. I'm not allowed to speak to you. Are you afraid it might be poisonous? said the farmer's wife. Look, I'll take a bite to prove that it's safe to sample my wares. On seeing that the apple had caused no harm to the farmer's wife, Snow White agreed to sample a taste. She opened the door and gracefully accepted the apple, taking a huge bite. Suddenly, Snow White began choking violently and fell down, dead. <laughs> the Queen laughed. The seven dwarves will fail now. Snow White is no more. <laughs> As soon as she got home, the queen went to the looking glass. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? The man in the looking glass replied, You are the fairest of them all? That cannot be denied. For from the poison apple, Snow White choked and died! Hurrah! said the elated queen. I knew it! <laughs> Meanwhile, the seven dwarves had found Snow White and declared her dead. There was no clue as to what had happened for the queen had taken the rest of the apple with her. As they went to bury Snow White, one of the dwarves tripped, causing the coffin to bounce against a tree, and the piece of apple stuck in Snow White's mouth popped out, giving her the chance to breathe again. As soon as she came round, she told the dwarves what had happened to her. It's a disgrace, said the first dwarf. I agree, said the second between them, they hatched a plot that involved going to the palace and telling King Horatio exactly what the wicked queen had been up to and reuniting him with his beloved daughter, Snow White. When the dwarves presented Snow White to the guards outside the palace, they recognised her instantly and let her in with her seven little companions. The king was over the moon to see his daughter and wept tears of joy. Queen Claudia, on the other hand, flew into a rage. Curses! she screamed. You win, Snow White. You're the fairest of them all and I'm not happy being second best. She then hurled herself through the looking glass, which took her into a dark abyss, where she remained forevermore. The looking glass itself slowly but surely vanished and was never seen again. How strange, said the king. That looking glass was jolly expensive. Never really liked it, though. It gave me the creeps. When the king learnt how Queen Claudia had behaved, he was appalled. Good riddance to her, he said. I've got my daughter back. That's the main thing. As he hugged a very happy Snow White. Over the next few years, Snow White grew up in the palace with the seven dwarves as her loyal subjects. Just think she said to her seven best friends, One day I will be queen and you will be my seven royal courtiers. This is the story that tells the tale of a mirror on the wall that told a wicked queen 
Snow White was the fairest of them all. The fairest of them all. Snow White. He liked to dress in the very, very best from his head down to his toes. This is a story that tells the tale of the Emperor's new clothes. The Emperor's new clothes. The Emperor's new clothes. Once upon a time, long ago, there was an emperor who was so vain he spent all his time purchasing fine suits of silk and satin and sparkling jewelry made of diamonds, rubies, and pearls. He ignored all his subjects and even his family, choosing to spend most of his time preening in front of the mirror. Of me. course, if there were a banquet or a ball, he would attend in order to show off his latest suit and jangle his expensive jewellery, thus ensuring he was, as always, the centre of attention. The emperor was so vain, he used to change his suits at least six times a day. Oh, how wonderful I look in my finery! he would say, much to the courtier's amusement. <laughs> He's so vain, said a passing scullery maid, as the emperor flounced through the hallways of the palace, wearing a bright pink flowing gown and a pearl-encrusted crown, so tall that it broke the chandeliers as he wafted by. Oops. One day... Two rascals, calling themselves tailors, arrived at the emperor's palace. They managed to secure an audience with the emperor on the basis that they were the most exclusive weavers in the world, catering only to the richest of sultans, emperors and kings. The rascals convinced the emperor that the cloth they used to create their wonderful attire was second to none. In fact, the suit they proposed to make for the emperor would be completely invisible to anyone not worthy of appreciating the exquisite nature of their fine work. This sounds marvellous, said the emperor. Just by wearing such a suit in public, I will be able to discover which subjects and servants are unfit to work for me here at the palace. I will also find out who is clever and worthy of my wonderful company. He gave the so-called tailors twelve bags of gold and told them to get to work on his new suit immediately. That's good. The rascals set up their looms and pretended to work hard on the emperor's new clothes. In fact, they did nothing more than go through the motions of making the suit. Just keep looking busy, said one. Don't worry, said the other. I will. I want to leave this palace alive with twelve bags of gold. <laughs> Every now and then, the emperor would pop his head around the door to check how his new suit was developing. How's it going? The rascals at their empty looms managed to assure His Highness that the job was almost complete. The Emperor initially convinced himself that he could see the marvellous work created by these two rogues and showed several of his close advisers the work in progress. In fear of being perceived as a simpleton, one minister said, It's going to be a remarkable suit. <laughs> I agree, said another, covering up for the fact that he could see nothing at all. As the word spread around the kingdom of this illustrious and expensive suit, the impostors managed to negotiate several more bags of gold in order to complete their work and make sure that the suit was to be the finest ever seen. The emperor brought his most trusty officer to see the impostors weaving the invisible suit. What do you think, said one of the so-called tailors. I think it's really uh, excellent, said the officer, not wishing to appear simple. 
and the emperor was finally convinced that he had employed the greatest tailors in history, tailors whose suits would make him not only the talk of the kingdom, but would make him famous throughout the world for his glittering appearance, his fabulous wealth, and, of course, his unprecedented intelligence. I will be remembered in history for being the greatest emperor of all time, he said to himself as he looked towards the empty looms. But on a second glance, he saw nothing whatsoever in the looms' empty frames. Have I been fooling myself? he mused. Perhaps I am a simpleton and unfit to be an emperor. Are you happy with our excellent work? inquired one of the rascals. We've worked so hard and the result is that you have the best suit that we've ever made. I think it's absolutely fabulous, said a meagre maid as she served the emperor a cup of his favourite herbal tea. Uh, yes, said the emperor. I couldn't agree more. It's the most marvellous suit ever created. And on saying this, he gave the two impostors another huge bag of gold and a bonus payment of diamonds, pearls, rubies and other precious stones. Once the rogue traders had put the finishing touches to their so-called masterpiece, the emperor invited a selection of his courtiers to view the tailor's creation. The suit was deemed a triumph by one and all. Despite the fact that in reality, the courtiers were already whispering that the suit might not actually exist. One of the emperor's slightly mischievous courtiers boldly made a suggestion loudly for all to hear. This suit is so important that we should have a procession through the streets for all the good people of the kingdom to see. I agree. That's a great idea, said the emperor's wife, with as much mischief in her voice as the courtier who had made the outrageous suggestion. Uh, I agree, said the slightly hesitant emperor. A date was set for a huge procession and street party in which the emperor would show off his new clothes. The night before the procession, the emperor could not sleep and paced around his bedroom in his ostentatious satin pyjamas, muttering to himself. Could it be that I am but a simpleton? He mumbled. Of course not. It is as clear as day that the suit I am to wear at the procession is the most noble suit ever to be worn, he replied to himself, thus justifying the reason for going on a procession that would put him on display to the entire kingdom. Stop worrying, said the Empress. You need some rest. Tomorrow is your big day. You're right, said the emperor. It's just a matter of last-minute nerves. The empress gave him a cup of herbal tea in order to relax him and grant her husband a few hours of precious sleep. During his deep sleep, he dreamt of a rapturous reception, not just from the people of his kingdom, but from the whole wide world. In his dream, his suit was the talk of noblemen and royal circles across the globe. Ha! Ah, this man is genius to have such a suit made, said one noted royal from a far-flung land. He is fit to rule the world, said another well-known, very important person. However, in the morning, when the emperor woke from his deep sleep, he was feeling a little uneasy and restless, despite giving out an aura that exuded both arrogance and confidence in equal measures. 
Today is the day that my importance will be realized by one and all. He boasted to the Empress. Hmm. Today will certainly be an interesting one, replied the Empress. And I am sure the good people of the kingdom will be talking about the event for years to come. On the big day, the two impostors draped the emperor in his new invisible attire. Oh, that jacket suits you, said one with a sly, crooked smile on his face. The trousers and gown are a joy to be old, said the other, as he went through the motions of fitting the emperor with the fictitious suit. There you go, your highness. Once the fitting was complete, the deluded emperor gazed at himself in the looking glass and vainly gave a twirl, gaining applause from the maids, servants, ministers and courtiers who were by now pandering to his every need. The emperor was then transported by a horse-drawn carriage through the kingdom, wearing nothing more than the invisible suit. Behind him, in the open-top carriage, were the two newly appointed royal tailors who were wearing some spectacular clothes purchased with the money they had accumulated through their ill-gotten gains. <laughs> How good we look compared with that fool, said one. I know, it's great, isn't it? said the other as they waved to the crowds along with the vain and delirious emperor. The crowd cheered and waved with delight as their ruler gave a twirl in order to give his now hysterical fans a good look at his glamorous new suit. But look, shouted an old apple woman, the emperor is wearing nothing at all. He has no clothes on whatsoever. She's right, you know, said a beggar, pointing at the emperor in sheer disbelief. In no time at all, the crowd was gasping in shock and even booing the now humiliated emperor. The mortified emperor suddenly went bright red as he came to realize that he had made a complete fool of himself. He turned round and looked towards the tailors, who in turn leapt from the carriage and disappeared into the crowd. Quick, let's get out of here. And as they did so, they dropped all their gold and precious stones on the street. The beggars and poorest members of the kingdom scrambled to pick up the impostor's lost treasures. This caught the emperor's eye, and it gave him some level of satisfaction. At least through his own ridiculous vanity, something positive had happened. Someone other than the emperor had gained from his vast wealth. Knowing nothing could be done to change his unfortunate situation, the emperor continued to parade through the streets with no clothes. But from that day on, he ceased to be vain, self-centered and pompous. He even occasionally chuckled with the empress when thinking of the day he learnt that there was more to life than appearing to be more important than others. He liked to dress in the very, very best from his head down to his toes. This is a story that tells the 